morning. Let me add my welcome to all of you to Colorado State University on behalf of members of our Board of Governors that are here, our faculty, staff, and students, and on behalf of President Joyce McConnell here at our Fort Collins campus. A special welcome to members of uh, those who are viewing the Salazar Center for North American Conservation through their symposium who are with us virtually. President Joe Biden appointed Tom Vilsack to be the 32nd Secretary of Agriculture a couple of months ago, <clears throat> but he wasn't new to the job, having served two terms as the Secretary of Agriculture, the 30th Secretary of Agriculture on, in the administration of President Barack Obama. Prior to those two terms, Secretary Vilsack served two terms as the governor of Iowa, also serving before that as a state senator and a mayor. Originally from Pittsburgh, Secretary Vilsack holds a bachelor's degree from Hamilton College and a law degree from the Albany School of Law. Those cover the what and the where and the when, but anyone who knows the secretary would tell you that they don't cover the who. Tom Vilsack has been someone that in an age of political division and lack of partisanship has always sought the common ground, being deeply interested in what unites us as Americans and what unites us as human beings. He's been committed and remains committed to agriculture and the proposition that science and education can sustainably feed our world. In that, he finds common ground with the cornerstones of America's land-grant university system and the things that have underpinned us for over one and a half centuries. And so it's not surprising that we find common ground around this event. It's perhaps not surprising as well that there's so much agreement in that President Abraham Lincoln created this land-grant university system on the same day that he created the position of Secretary of Agriculture for the United States, July 1st, 1862. I think if Lincoln were here today, he would be proud to see what has grown from the seeds of those land-grant universities, and he'd be proud of our Secretary of Agriculture. Colorado State is similarly proud of our programs in agriculture and the sustainability of all of the campuses in our system. And so we're proud to host this event. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you the 32nd Secretary of Agriculture of the United States of America, and a man I'm proud to call my friend, Tom Vilsack. Uh, Chancellor, thank you very, very much for that kind introduction. Um, and just so everyone knows, that's about as kind as he can be to me. Um, I can show you some tweets and some uh, text messages that would, resect, would would see, you'd see the real Tony Frank, the Cub fan. Um, but I really appreciate uh, the invitation and certainly appreciate the friendship, uh, which has been forged over a number of years. And I will tell you that it's a real honor now, for me to be speaking with all of you today at the Salazar Center's International Symposium on Conservation Impact. You know, Ken Salazar is a friend, uh, really excited about his opportunity to now be ambassador. Uh, he is a man who's got a lot of talent, uh, a lot of talent, but also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of titles. Uh, he is uh, was a great senator from the state. Uh, he and I were partners together in the Obama administration cabinet. And obviously he had a, a great run as well as attorney general of this great state. So he is a, a, a true public servant. So I'm glad to be here uh, in a center named after uh, Ken. And it's good to see uh, Governor Ritter here as well. And also a good friend, family friend, uh, and someone who has been a leader uh, in energy across this country. And it's great to be back on campus, uh, to be with many friends uh, who are dedicated here to the great mission of a land grant university and who understand the land grants role in helping American agriculture meet the food needs of our nation and the world while doing so sustainably. It's especially great to see in the audience uh, some students uh, here today who have an exciting but I would say a challenging future ahead of them. So much has happened uh, since I was last on campus. We've all been impacted by the pandemic and it's also been true that while dealing with the pandemic, many in our country, particularly in the West, have also been dealing with the wrath of climate change in the form of a severe and profound drought, intense and raging wildfires, 
and destructive and life-threatening storms and, and floods. Farmers, ranchers, producers, and foresters have experienced all of those impacts. And that's what brings me here today to speak to you. And I wanna to speak to you today about the near-term and the long-term impacts and how the Department of Agriculture at President Biden's direction intends to help. Let's me be, let me begin with the near term. A combination of rising temperatures, heat waves, early snow melt, and low rainfall this year has brought record-breaking drought to folks across the West. How bad has it been? Well, the drought monitor shows that more than 40% of mainland US has experienced some level of drought since September, 2020. And more than 20% of our country has experienced extreme or exceptional drought since April. But the six states that make up the US Southwest for the months January, 2020 through August of 2021, it has been exceptional with the lowest total precipitation rate and the third highest daily average temperature rate recorded since records were started in 1885, which together have imposed on the West an unyielding, unprecedented, and unforgiving drought. Livestock producers in the West have borne the brunt of this drought. And sadly, many are now faced with the possibility of having to liquidate their herds after spending a lifetime building them up because they simply cannot grow or cannot afford the feed to take care of their livestock. If you travel across the country, you'll find in the South and in the Northeast that the situation was not too little rain, but instead too much rain and wind, causing significant damage to crops, livestock, and farm buildings. All of these folks need help. And it's not just weather-related concerns that grip our nation's producers, but challenges arising from zoonotic diseases, which now pose threats never thought possible in this country. When African swine fever impacted the hog industry in Asia, we took notice. We recognized the risk, but felt safe because after all, an ocean separated our hog industry from this devastating disease. Today, we now realize we're not immune. And our entire hog industry here in the US is on alert because African swine fever is now in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti. So the Dominican and Haitian farmers need our help, which means that our farmers need our help. What do these three climate and disease related events have in common besides the need for help? Well, each of these calls for help can be answered by USDA through a tool and the use of funds from what is called the Commodity Credit Corporation. You know, in the midst of another challenging time for American agriculture in the 1930s during the Dust Bowl, President Roosevelt and Congress created the Commodity Credit Corporation and provided it with resources. And it has become a powerful tool that allows the USDA to be nimble, aggressive, and prescriptive in confronting challenges faced then and now. Let me explain how we can use this tool to help with drought, storms, and African swine fever. An African swine fever outbreak in the United States would have a devastating impact on our economy, on our swine industry, and would cause billions of dollars in lost production and in trade. It would force many farmers into bankruptcy and cost thousands of jobs. It is critical uh, to keep this disease out of our country, but we have to act aggressively. To help the Dominican Republic and Haiti contain this disease so we can prevent this grave threat from reaching our shores. So today I'm directing my staff uh, to work with the Office of Management and Budget and the Treasury Department to transfer up to as much as $500 million of funds from the Commodity Credit Corporation to prevent the spread of African swine fever. Now we'll use these resources to support a robust expansion and coordination of monitoring, surveillance, prevention, quarantining, and other activities in the Dominican Republic and Haiti to help eliminate the risk, while also shoring up our efforts here in the US to prevent the disease from getting to the mainland. With this action, we intend to do everything we can to protect our trade, our economy, our pork industry, and the jobs connected to it. We'll also tap the CCC to work with our traditional disaster programs to help farmers repair store damage, 
reduce the high cost of feed, and pay down the high cost of transportation that many livestock producers are now incurring to haul feed and water to their operations. After all, the goal here is for producers to stay on the farm and not have to sell the farm. The pandemic and climate related events exposed our overall food system as highly consolidated, fragile, and I think less resilient than we had thought. Major disruptions in supply chains have arisen from our ports and even into our school lunchrooms. American producers are frustrated by the fact that empty container ships are leaving our ports while agricultural products sit on the dock waiting to leave our shores. As you all know, exports are critical to the bottom line for our farmers and any disruption can cause stress and concern. So those who rely on exports for their profit or their employment, they also need help. At the same time, many school districts across the United States are now being told that shortages exist in the food normally ordered for and provided for our school meals. Many contracts with long-term vendors are being canceled. Without supplies or vendors, the schools will be unable to meet their full responsibility of providing quality meals to our children. Meals our kids need to be at their very best. School nutrition officials and our students, they need help. Where can those who need help moving product overseas or moving product down a lunch line seek that help? That's right, the Department of Agriculture and the Commodity Credit Corporation. Today, we're also announcing our intent to provide resources from CCC to do what we can to relieve the bottleneck at our ports and also to help our schools continue to feed our children wholesome and nutritious meals. All told, we'll transfer a total of $3 billion from CCC so we can immediately look for ways to provide the help needed by those combating African swine fever, those needing to feed livestock, those repairing storm damage, exporting our products or feeding our children. I spoke earlier of near-term challenges and long-term challenges. Let me now focus on the long-term challenge of climate change and how farmers, ranchers, and producers might be able to adapt to the changes, mitigate the impacts of those changes, and create a market opportunity by embracing climate smart agricultural practices. Now, fortunately, policymakers in, in Congress and in Washington, D.C., and in state capitals understand the need to act and address climate change. Congress is now considering a significant investment in climate smart practices in both the bipartisan infrastructure and jobs bill and the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill. The House of Representatives Agricultural Committee will soon do a markup of a Senate-passed bipartisan bill called the Growing Climate Solutions Act, which will aid in the development of markets for sustainably produced products. All of these measures and others calling for the support of precision agriculture and better forest management all underscore the need for action. Now, the Biden-Harris administration has called for a whole of government approach to achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by 2050, which scientists say is required to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. The president's climate plan also sets a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by somewhere between 50 and 52% by the year 2030. Agriculture, forestry, and rural America can, will, and I believe must play an important role in meeting the president's 2030 reduction goal and the net zero emission goal by 2050. Before I share with you what we're doing at USDA to advance efforts on climate to meet those goals, I wanna briefly state the values driving our efforts because as important as what we do, it's also important as how we're going to do it. USDA's work on climate change will be focused on partnerships with agriculture, forestry, tribes, states, businesses, universities, nonprofits. Our work will be incentive-based and will work to help farmers create new income opportunities on a voluntary basis with markets for agriculture and forestry products. Our work on climate smart agriculture and forestry will be farmer 
rancher and forester led. Because after all, climate smart agriculture and forestry has simply has to work for our farmers, for our ranchers and our forest owners, or it won't work for our climate. Getting the science right regarding the role that agriculture and forestry can play in reducing greenhouse gas emissions is also critical. And I think you all know that here on campus. USDA will invest in the science and quantification of carbon sequestration and greenhouse gases. So we can truly demonstrate to our country and to the market, the benefits of our investments. Finally, equity will be a vital consideration in all we do on climate change at USDA. We must ensure that programs we support and the investments we make are available to everyone and that we take special steps to ensure that farmers of color and small and medium sized farming operations are able to participate and prosper as a result of this work. Now we haven't developed our climate work in isolation. This past spring, we solicited the views of tribes and states and other stakeholders across agriculture and forestry on how we should develop our own department's climate smart agriculture and forestry strategy, which we released in May. As we move forward in the months and weeks ahead, we wanna make sure we're able to provide more opportunities to engage with and listen to our stakeholders and consumers. Now, USDA has a wide range of farm bill conservation programs that provide cost share and financial assistance to farmers, ranchers, and forest owners to implement a variety of conservation practices. Now, these programs provide an opportunity to work with producers and landowners to implement a number of conservation practices that sequester carbon, that improve soil health, that protect our precious water resources, that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote resiliency. And we're already leveraging our existing programs to target climate outcomes and to encourage the voluntary adoption of climate smart solutions across the landscape. In a way that's good for producers and in a way that's also good for their bottom line. For example, earlier this summer, USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, invested over $50 million in our Environmental Equality Incentive Program, EQIP, in climate smart agricultural and forestry practices, 10 million of which was designed to support climate smart practices through voluntary conservation practices in 10 targeted states. And over 40 million of which was to help producers in Arizona, California, Oregon, and here in Colorado to help them alleviate the immediate impacts of drought and other natural resources uh, challenges that they were facing on working lands. And just this week, NRCS announced another $75 million for 15 partner-led projects through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, alternative funding arrangements effort that focuses on climate smart agriculture and forestry and other conservation priorities, as well as improving access for historically underserved producers. Now, two of these projects were developed by partners here in Colorado, including the Gunnison River Drought Resiliency and Restoration Project, which is designed to restore wetlands and riparian areas uh, while improving irrigation water management on working ranches in three distinct tributaries of the Gunnison River. The other project is the Upper Arkansas Forest Fund project, which is designed to reduce the risk of severe fires in the Upper Arkansas River watershed. And earlier this year, we also announced several changes to the Conservation Reserve Program to increase participation and to increase the climate benefits of that program. We accepted more than two and a half million acres in Grassland Conservation Reserve Program signup. And that was more than double last year's signup. It allowed us to surpass our goal of signing up 4 million acres by in fact, signing up 5.3 million acres in all of our signups and the great state of Colorado was among the top states for producing contracts. Now USDA is partnering with farmers in a creative way, as well with our crop insurance program to promote climate smart practices. As part of our pandemic assistance for producers initiative, we created the pandemic cover crop program. Now this provides bonus payments uh, to producers who plant cover crop systems to protect soil health and increase carbon sequestration. And over the next three years, we intend to make climate smart agriculture and forestry a priority in implementing all of our Farm Bill programs. 
Now, leveraging our conservation programs must also go hand in hand with efforts to provide good information, solid information about climate smart agriculture and how it impacts our farms, our ranches, and our forests. Providing technical assistance will require strong partnerships with our states, our tribes, our universities, our soil and water conservation districts, and many others. To ensure our programs are available to all farmers, we'll also have to strengthen our work with the uh, historic black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and tribal colleges. Now, I'm confident that here at CSU, you're gonna to continue to do good work in promoting conservation. And I'm looking forward to the new SPUR campus's uh, contribution uh, to be engaged as well. Uh, I know that there's gonna be significant work done on water and food and agriculture innovation at that SPUR campus. Now a climate smart workforce at USDA and in agriculture is also essential to prepare the department and the industry and our stakeholders for the changes ahead. By building climate literacy across USDA and across agriculture, uh, we can ensure that we can deliver science-based, data-driven and customer-focused information on both the risks and the mitigation opportunities. Our USDA climate hubs are increasingly becoming a first point of contact on climate change across the department. We're gonna to continue to support our hubs. We'll be investing in, do, in doing so, we'll be investing in our ability to reach more farmers and more stakeholders. Now in January, President Biden also announced the formation of a new civilian climate corps. Now, the civilian climate corps builds on an existing foundation of public private partnerships that provides job training and work experiences for young adults and veterans to accomplish natural resource objectives. I think here there is an opportunity for intersection as well on the CSU campus with your Together We Grow effort. Here's an opportunity for a number of participants in that program to see the benefit of the Civilian Climate Corps. Specifically at USDA at our Forest Service, we're looking for increased capacity through this Corps to facilitate an accelerated pace of fire risk, risk reduction and response, reforestation, water reforestation, and infrastructure maintenance. Now, I'm in the West, and so I'd be remiss if I did not mention wildfires. You know, in 2021, as of today, we've had over 45,000 wildfires that have burned more than 5.7 million acres across U.S. On July 4th this year, the multinational coordinating group moved the national wildfire preparation level to level five. Now, this is the highest level of wildland fire activity, and it was at the earliest time in the past 10 years and stayed there for a record 69 days. This is an aberration. Climate change, coupled with a history of putting out natural fires over the last 100 years, has resulted in conditions in our forests and wildlands that are very dangerous. Overstocked forest and dry conditions linked to climate change are a difficult combination. And it means that we're going to continue to see difficult fire seasons in the future unless we act and act now. To reduce the threat of wildfires, the Forest Service has to increase dramatically the treatments in our national forests. Our challenge is simple to state. We have to more than triple the number of acres we tr uh, treat uh, annually with scientifically sound thinning and prescribed fire methods. Improved markets for wood products through new products like mass timber and cross laminated timber can certainly help underwrite the cost of restoration while storing carbon and wood products over the long term. Now, these markets will also maintain incentives for private landowners and tribes to maintain and manage their forests. But on federal lands, so much of the timber is of low value that these markets alone are not enough to underwrite the cost of these treatments. Treating more acres is going to cost more money. And while the president's budget increases investment in treatment, the resources called for under the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill are absolutely essential and will guarantee that our forests will get the attention they desperately need. Now, science, as you all know here in this great land grant university is critical uh, to our work in agriculture and to our work at USDA. And at USDA, we've targeted and will continue to target our climate research efforts to better understand 
the full range of potential climate impacts. We need to accelerate the development of science-based solutions. We need to inform the deployment of adaptation strategies. We need to continue to develop new surveys and new tools and analyses to pinpoint barriers and to access and build these schools, uh, tools and make them available to our farmers, much like Carmet Farm, uh, a tool that you all here at CSU help to develop. Our farmers, ranchers, and producers need these tools. Now it's critical that we leverage our work with the efforts of the private sector to create a research pipeline for new technologies and systems to mitigate climate change. The fact is meeting the commitment of zero emissions by 2050 will not happen based on current technology or even with significant public research and development alone. The private sector is engaged and needs to be engaged in advancing solutions and they are such as new fertilizer formulations, new methods of protein production, a new generation of feed additives for ruminants and advanced manure systems. Our agricultural research service is establishing a comprehensive climate change center of excellence that will ensure that these technologies and others are positioned to be adopted out in the field. The center will create a research pipeline for climate smart technologies. We'll cooperate with the private sector to assess the performance of new technologies and conservation practices. And we'll partner with our conservation programs at USDA to enable our producers to adopt these climate solutions. And we're also gonna play an important role in supporting and promoting clean energy. We believe biofuels today reduce greenhouse emissions by somewhere between 30 to 40% relative to gasoline. So we think that biofuels for the foreseeable future will have an important role in climate efforts. Just this month, USDA joined a government-wide sustainable aviation fuel grand challenge with the target of making 100% drop-in sustainable aviation biofuel by 2050. This is a market potential of 35 billion gallons, nearly double the current biofuel industry. Our efforts at USDA are gonna focus on feedstock development and on supply chain efficiencies. We'll also invest in biogas. Livestock methane is an important contributor to climate change, but it can be, it can be captured and turned into energy through methane digesters. And over the last two years, we've invested in 18 digester projects at USDA to capture and reuse methane as a renewable energy and fuel source. Methane digesters and manure management can't address all of methane emissions. So we'll continue to look for ways to reduce methane emissions through improved feed mix and additives that can reduce uh, enteric methane. All of these programs and tools are great, but the reality is we've got to do more. We've got to do more to promote partnerships and investments, particularly from the private sector in climate smart agriculture and forestry. U.S. consumers, food processors and retailers are demonstrating an increasing interest for agricultural commodities produced using climate smart agricultural practices and for forestry practices in the construction business. Internationally, important trading partners are considering criteria and preferences related to greenhouse gas performance of imported agricultural commodities and associated food products. These represent new and expanding markets, which can provide an opportunity and a challenge for our farmers and ranchers. The challenge to undertake and embrace climate smart agricultural practices and to take full advantage of this growing market opportunity. A wide range of market-based approaches exist to incentivize climate-friendly agricultural commodities. They include voluntary markets for carbon, where agriculture and forestry can uh, provide carbon credits, sustainable supply chain initiatives, and insetting, which is an approach where companies reduce emissions within their own supply and production facilities. Opportunities can also include markets for low carbon biofuels and renewable energy. Now these activities offer the potential to leverage private sector demand to incentivize adoption of climate smart practices while also providing for farmers new income streams. However, barriers exist and are hampering the growth of these market opportunities. 
Market barriers include the risk and the cost to producers in adopting these practices. These costs can be very expensive and the high costs of measuring and verifying greenhouse gas reductions adds to that expensive cost. Now are concerns by many in the environmental community about the ability to accurately measure and track the climate gains from agriculture and forestry. Our farmers, ranchers, and producers are great stewards. We need to make sure that we can give them credit for what they are doing and what they will do. This initiative that we are launching will place a high premium on accurate greenhouse gas accounting. It's absolutely vital if we're to establish consumer confidence in these emerging products and markets. So today, we're beginning a process to develop what we refer to as a climate smart partnership initiative that will help finance the production of climate smart commodities through a series of large scale pilots and demonstration projects funded from the USDA. And as importantly, to also help as part of this effort to finance the steps necessary to properly measure and validate the environmental response and result from these practices. This initiative will provide support to farm groups, businesses, states, tribes, and other nonprofit organizations that are working with multiple producers and landowners to apply climate smart agricultural practices on farms, ranches, and forested areas. The goal is to scale up the deployment of climate smart agriculture and forestry practices, while also increasing to how best, our understanding of how best to monitor, measure and track the greenhouse gas impacts of these practices. Let me give you examples. USDA might support a group of dairy farmers seeking to reduce emissions from manure and increasing carbon sequestration on copper land as part of their milk production system. We could fund corn and soybean producers interested in producing a climate smart commodity for their retail buyer, which might also qualify them for participation in private market carbon credits or other ecosystem service credit systems. We could resource a biofuel company in its development of a low carbon biofuel or help organic producers quantify the climate result of their organic practices. Each project will include efforts to measure and track the climate benefits over time. Now these projects will help create new market opportunities for producers and landowners through the production of commodities that meet the growing demand for sustainably produced products in the US and will help to preserve and expand export opportunities for these commodities, as well as potentially qualifying for ecosystem market uh, credits. I wanna be clear, this initiative is not a carbon bank or a carbon market. It's not even a conservation program, although it, both may be available to producers as a result of this program. This initiative is first and foremost, a commodity program. One that seeks to empower farmers, ranchers, producers, and foresters to produce climate smart commodities, meeting domestic and global consumer demand. Now as a commodity program, and one that helps promote markets and exports, the CCC resources can be used to fund this effort. And if they are used, they will be at a significant level that will allow us to accomplish the purpose of this initiative without compromising CC's other important role to support farm bill programs and meet emergency needs as they arise. In thinking about launching this initiative, we listened carefully to agriculture, forestry, conservation, and other stakeholders, and especially took note of the recommendations of the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, a broad-based coalition of farm, forestry, and conservation groups. And we're not finished listening and learning. The first step forward will be the publication in the next several weeks of a formal request for information. So that before we begin implementing this program, we wanna make sure it works for agriculture and forestry. We wanna make sure it's equitable. We wanna make sure it's adequately resourced and has the strongest environmental and scientific integrity. We'll seek comments for a period of 30 days from publication and work any modifications that we learn necessary into our final proposal. From a once in a century global pandemic to the continuous and intensifying threats of climate change, agriculture and forestry and rural communities are not short on challenges. But for every challenge, 
there is an opportunity. And we at USDA want to help farmers, ranchers, producers, forest owners, and rural Americans to help meet the challenge and to take full advantage of this opportunity. In doing so, we intend to build our ag and food system back better, stronger, fairer, more resilient by providing the help that is needed most and by lowering the threats of climate change with resilient supply chains, with new market opportunities for farmers, ranchers, and forest owners, with access to the goods and products that consumers want here and around the world, and with more economic opportunity and good paying jobs in rural America. Now these challenges and opportunities are of this moment and they require us to work together. We believe there's no time to waste. The students here on campus at CSU are the next generation of leaders in our food and agricultural system. And I believe that they are depending upon us to leave them a better system than the one that we inherited. So let's get started. Thank you very much. I'm so used to wearing these doggone masks, I didn't take it off. So I apologize for that, but you know, it is what it is in today's world. So thank you all very much. It's great to be back. Well, that was great with or without the mask. Uh, and I would have to say from personal experience that members of the White House staff and uh, members of the cabinet are always jealous of the Secretary uh, of Agriculture's ability to access the Commodity Credit Corporation, the funds and flexibility of that program, as was evidenced today in those great announcements, uh, was always something that everyone wished they had. And I would also just note, uh, having listened to Secretary Vilsack, that uh, President Biden pledged to build a all of government approach and a superstar team of people who are committed uh, to the climate crisis. Uh, and I think as you listen to him discuss uh, the new strategy around climate smart agriculture, building up the civilian climate core, the use of the climate, cubs, cl uh, climate hubs that Secretary Vilsack himself started when he was secretary during the Obama administration, uh, you see that uh, the that President Biden has made good uh, on that commitment to get all these agencies moving in the right direction. And that's why it's such a pleasure uh, to introduce our second keynote speaker, Deb Hallen, the Secretary of the United States Department of Interior, a member of the Laguna Pueblo tribe and a 35th generation New Mexican. She made history when she was one of the first Native American women to serve in Congress, where in her first term, she chaired the National Park Subcommittee where we got to work together. In Congress, she focused on environmental justice, climate change, missing and murdered indigenous women and family friendly policies. For the students who are, who are in office, I think I would point out that uh, Deb put herself through the University of New Mexico and the, and the University of New Mexico Law School. And if it's any consolation, she and her daughter, who also graduated from the University of New Mexico, are still paying off their student loans. Um, of course, she made history again earlier this year when she became the first Native American in the entire history of the United States, the first Native American to serve uh, in a president's cabinet. So without further ado, let me turn it over to you, my friend uh, and colleague, Secretary Deb Hallett. Thank you so much, um, John. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me at this year's North American Conservation Symposium. And greetings from San Diego, where I'm on the ancestral homelands of the Kumeyaay people. Um, John, it's so good to see you as always uh, and uh, appreciate you so much and, and everything that you do. I uh, also want to take a moment to thank you for all uh, that you have done over the years to advance conservation and climate action across our country. Uh, there are few people who have moved the needle uh, in the past decade as much as you have. 
uh, truly. And, um, and so we, we thank you. Um, so many of the places that we know and love are protected today and for the generations to come because you helped to make it so. I also want to thank the Salazar Center for hosting this event to elevate diverse voices and advance conservation across North America. These convenings are important to help inspire and align action. So I have a really cool job. <laughs> On Monday, I attended the launch of the Landsat 9, a satellite that will orbit the planet and transmit images that help us understand the Earth's changing landscapes through a continuous 50-year record of observations. Uh, and all those uh, images, I'll say, are available to the public. Uh, yesterday, I spent the day in San Diego where I visited a wildlife refuge with an inspiring class of fifth graders and witnessed the great work that the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing to connect urban and underserved communities to the great outdoors. Uh, today, I get to connect with hundreds of people through this symposium who are passionate about the need to conserve, restore, and connect more lands and waters for the benefit of current and future generations. Later this morning, I will speak to a number of Northwest tribal nations who are aligned on all of these same goals. As you might imagine, this job also has moments of heartache. This morning, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that it is proposing to remove 23 species from the Endangered Species Act list. It's not because we did enough to save the warblers or the fruit bats or the fish or the mussels on the list. It's because they went extinct. The specifics for each of the species demise vary, but the story arc is essentially the same. Humans altered their habitat in a significant way, and we couldn't or didn't do enough to ultimately change the trajectory before it was too late. But as, but, this moment, as sobering as it is, can serve as a wake-up call. Our children and grandchildren will not know the earth as we do unless we change the status quo. We've got to do better by this planet and we need to do it now. That's why President Biden launched the America the Beautiful initiative earlier this year. It's a call to action to all of us across the country, from local communities to tribes to private landowners and beyond, to improve the health of our lands, waters, and wildlife. It includes the first ever goal to conserve 30% of US lands and ocean by 2030, an ambitious but highly achievable goal if we all roll up our sleeves. President Biden's conservation vision is one that recognizes that nature offers some of the most cost-effective ways to address the climate crisis that we need to do more to stem the steep loss of nature and wildlife, that we need to address the inequitable access to nature and its benefits to communities of color, and that restoring and conserving lands and waters is just really good for the economy. It's an inherently pragmatic approach that puts people at the center. America the Beautiful does not set out to make everything a national park or wilderness area although they have their roles, of course. Instead, it outlines an inclusive vision where working lands and urban parks and tribal lands can all knit together to be greater than the sum of their parts. Already, we have seen this national goal inspire local action. My home state of New Mexico, for example, has set a state-specific goal in motion with early priorities placed on wildfire migration corridors I'm sorry, wildlife migration corridors and watersheds. In Boise, Idaho, in Boise, Idaho, they're crafting unique goals to promote pollinators, increase the city's tree canopy, and protect the Boise River. And tribal nations and consortia representing more than 50 federally recognized tribes have weighed in on the conservation goal to outline ways that they can advance tribally led priorities. They're all among the hundreds of counties, cities, states, tribes, and local elected officials in the United States who have formally expressed support for this ambitious and locally led conservation effort. I'm proud of what we're working on at Interior to advance this vision, and I'll share a few examples. 
Earlier this year, the National Park Service announced a record $150 million in funding for the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program. Every young person should have a safe place to get outside, and this program helps states to build parks and underserved communities across the country. It's one of the many ways that we are trying to advance equitable access to nature. Yesterday, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced nearly $80 million in funding to states that will help conserve and protect nearly 56,000 acres of habitat for imperiled species. The grants will be matched by nearly $50 million in partner funds. This is part of the service's larger effort to work hand in hand with states and people to improve habitat and connectivity. Our partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, for example, provides financial and technical assistance to landowners who are interested in improving their lands to benefit wildlife. It's exactly the kind of program that we should be investing in where we can keep working lands working, help ensure farms and ranches are passed on to the next generation, and to promote healthy natural systems that are good for all of us. To me, ranchers like Herb and Bev Hammond in South Dakota embody America the Beautiful. Cattle ranchers for over 45 years, Herb and Bev recognized one of their best assets was the grassland itself. Located within the largest remaining piece of northern tall grass prairie in the United States, they knew that if the grassland remained healthy, that the cattle and ranch would prosper. Herb and Bev worked with the service to conserve existing grasslands to restore five drained wetlands through collaborative conservation. Herb and Bev ensured that their ranch provided healthy grass cover and habitat for their cattle, grassland birds, and other wildlife. The significant announcement from Secretary Vilsack today is another example of how the Biden administration is focused on pragmatic solutions that can advance conservation and climate action and create new sources of income across rural America. To be sure, advancing the goals of America the Beautiful won't be easy. Some will want to see the effort fail for political reasons. Despite the fact that our outdoor heritage is a source of pride for so many Americans, some are concerned it's a land grab. It isn't. But the consequences of failing to change how we do conservation and who benefits from it, well, they're simply too great to ignore. I don't want to see another extinction announcement. I don't want to look my child in the eyes and think that I haven't done everything I could to pass on a brighter future to them. Last week, Science Journal published a study that confirmed what many of us have always known. Indigenous people have been here for time immemorial. For generations, we have lived sustainably on the land and we are all connected. I learned a deep respect for the natural world from my dad who made sure I hiked to the tops of mesas, waded in icy skulled streams, and knew how to bait a hook. I felt this respect profoundly in my grandparents' cornfield at the Pueblo of Laguna, where as a young child, I learned how interconnected the world is. The food we ate came from the seeds we planted, which relied on the sun and the water from the river. The same river relied on snow in the mountains during the winter time. It was a lesson on how even the worms we picked off the corn were interconnected in this natural system that supports all life. I want everyone to have the same connection to the great outdoors that was gifted to me. If we can help more people access nature, no matter where they're from or what their background, we will help lift up the next generations of stewards for this earth. Thank you again so much to the Salazar Center for creating this platform to highlight the need to advance conservation across North America. I look so forward to passing the microphone in a few minutes to my colleague, Brenda Mallory, who is doing a fantastic job as chair of the White House Council on Environmental Equality, environmental quality, uh, including spearheading the administration's commitments to advance environmental justice. And with that, I'll turn it back to you for questions, John. Thank you, Secretary. That was that was terrific, and I, and I really appreciate your laying out that vision. Uh, and I think uh, one of the questions 
that for, uh, I'm, uh, I'm being, being cued to the audience questions that we want to begin with that came from the audience was uh, you spoke a little bit to the, to, to the specific example of how private lands uh, alongside public lands will help realize uh, the vision of America, the beautiful. Uh, but for uh, people out in who are listening to this, who want to get involved, uh, what should communities do to get involved, to, to be part of this movement, this effort uh, to preserve 30, uh, 30 by 30? Absolutely. Well, of course, um, the Department of the Interior, this is one of our uh, goals. Um, and uh, I mean, reach out to us, right? We want to hear from you. We've had a number of, um, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sessions uh, where we've invited folks to be a part, listening sessions and so forth. Uh, but we want to hear from you. So reach out to us and um, we we'll um, we'll have a conversation and move forward from there. Um, but, you know, we're going to rely a tremendous amount on private landowners. You know, my sister and her husband, they have a ranch up in northeastern New Mexico. Uh, they care deeply about the, their land. They love their animals. Um, there is nothing better for their animals than to have a healthy ecosystem. So, um, so I know that, um, you know, those are folks who, who, who I know can be a part of this, but um, this is, I, I think this conservation effort, 30 by 30, um, it will just unite our country, really. And I'm really looking forward to, to getting down into the, the weeds, uh, so to speak, about <laughs> how we're going to make this happen. Um, another question, uh, what can we learn from indigenous stewardship and knowledge systems that may inform uh, broader land use management approaches? I know this is being tried in California uh, versus traditional, uh, using uh, traditional controlled burn practices. Uh, and, and how are you, uh, I think, drawing in those voices into the Department of Interior's uh, process of planning for a, a world where we're going to have more fire. Absolutely. Well, first of all, um, the Biden administration, one of their top priorities is ensuring tribal consultation. President Biden has instructed all of the cabinet members. Uh, we're using an all of government approach to ensure that we're living up to the trust responsibilities by the federal government toward Indian tribes. So um, we have had a number of consultations already. Uh, we'll continue to have them bringing tribes to the table uh, before decisions are made. That's, that's always a good policy to make sure that we're hearing from folks uh, before we make those hard decisions. And, um, and, you know, tribes are, yes, they have been stewards of this land for millennia. Um, they were the first stewards of the land. And, and in fact, I, I feel that if we would have uh, listened to tribes early on, um, we wouldn't have suffered some of the worst ecological disasters um, uh, in our country's history, like the Dust Bowl, for example. So, um, so we're just bringing tribes to the table early. Uh, we are going to uh, make them a part of, uh, of you know, the way we manage lands. And yes, it's happening in California. Um, but we want to bring them in um, long before right disasters kind of strike. So, um, so it's we're committed to that and um, and look forward to always making them a part of of what we're doing at the interior. Do you anticipate more opportunities for co-management of federal lands uh, between the Department of Interior and tribes going forward? We we really do. Yes. Yes, I think that's a win-win situation. Yes. Um, another audience question. Uh, Nada Culver, I hope I got the name right, and Chris French were quoted saying they would count grazing lands towards conservation purposes, which would mean that almost all public lands would already count under 30 by 30. Do you think we have already reached our 30 to 30 goal? Well, there's no uh, sure way to tell. Um, Currently, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey is working on an atlas 
um, where we can sort of, you know, uh, count the lands in a more um, systematic way to make sure that we are um, getting some, tr you know, some a true idea of how much is conserved. Um, I can't say whether we've reached the goal, um, but um, we're going to keep working at it and, and certainly um, make sure that those private landowners have the support they need to, um, uh, to be a part of, of this great conservation effort. And uh, uh, in terms of informing the public and the public commitment to measuring against that 30 by 30 target, uh, what's your what's your sense of how you want to report back to the American people, uh, and how do you prioritize, uh, you know, full protection versus uh, some of the other kind of conservation uh, initiatives that the, the department is undertaking, both on public and private lands? Uh, well, I I'm not exactly sure um, if I got the question right, but I'll try to answer it. Um, Yes, working lands will be a part of this effort. Um, and as I meant in the example of my remarks of Urban Bev, who are doing everything they can to, to bring back um, the natural features of the land that they have uh, with the help of the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the Department of the Interior as a whole. I mean, we want those, uh, we wanna be able to help those folks um, across the country. Um, and uh, healthy, you know, it, it's sort of like a healthy ecosystem. Uh, that's what we're looking for. We, we want to make sure that, um, that wildlife has the habitat they need to uh, continue so that we don't face any more extinctions. But, but I think that, um, that when we're able to uh, begin um, counting those lands, um, we'll, we'll have a true picture, but certainly, um, uh, we, you know, if we can serve more, that wouldn't hurt, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, well, we got about five more minutes, Secretary, uh, and I want to get to uh, another audience question, which is, Secretary Howland, thank you for your incredible leadership. What culture shifts are required for Native and non-Native conservationists to work together more and, to, and more effectively? Well, I think I look at it as our job of um, bringing those folks together, right? Um, as I said, tribal consultation is a priority for this administration. Um, bringing tribes to the table, making sure they have the support that they need, uh, uh, making sure that we are listening. You know, one of the things uh, that, that comes up a lot um, um, are sacred sites for Indian tribes. A lot, a lot of these sacred sites are not within the boundaries of tribal lands, but um, might be part of a national park or might be part of a private landowner. It's, we wanna like get that conversation going so that um, our country understands that tribes have an obligation to, to the land uh, and the fact that the land may not be within their ex, uh, exterior boundaries doesn't um, preclude their obligation to care for that land. So uh, by working cooperatively with, um, with, uh, with us, um, we wanna make sure that, that they have those opportunities to see that their land is, is cared for. <clears throat> And, um, and, and I, I think the only way we get there is by, um, by making sure we have those conversations, by giving tribes the support that they need, um, and by ensuring that we're, um, you know, making sure they, they have the opportunities to, to um, have their cultural and traditional um, activities on those lands. Um, kind of following up on that, any, any sense of time frame for restoration of the boundaries on Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante? I don't have a sense of it, but I can tell you that- um, uh, Pretty President, sure I know what you recommended. President Biden's <laughs> commitment to our environment is, is it's, it's 
you know, it's it's unequivocal. He 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 absolutely uh, cares deeply about ensuring that we are going to um, uh, conserve these lands into the future. So um, my guess is that um, uh, the, when the president um, uh, is ready and has time, I know he's a little busy right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, not to underscore the fact that we want to get some things through Congress so that we have uh, the, uh, the, the opportunities to continue our efforts in every way we can. And so um, I don't have a time frame, but, um, but I, I, I support the, the president in, in his efforts. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll keep pushing. <laughs> we want to see it happen. Uh, uh, just a couple, two more. Uh, uh, and this one's from our, our, our neighbors in Canada. Greetings from Nature Canada and the conservation community north of the border. Would love to hear your thoughts on prospects for our federal governments to work together on the 30 by 30 goal, including su on supporting indigenous-led conservation. Oh, we, we, you know, I've had several conversations with, um, with ministers in Canada, and we're always willing to work. Um, you know, look, wildlife uh, d doesn't know borders, right? Wild wildlife doesn't uh, stop when they're at the Canadian border. They, uh, they have patterns, they live by their instincts. Um, so it, it's, goes without saying that we need to work cooperatively to ensure that those habitats um, are contiguous for, uh, for species that, that cross the border uh, into another country. So, um, so I'm always willing to work, uh, always willing to lift up indigenous communities, regardless of what country they're from, uh, so that we can all work together. And um, I look forward to that. Um, and last question, Secretary. Uh, Secretary General has said that uh, we're experiencing a code red uh, on, uh, on in the climate crisis uh, with a, a rash of recent reports. Uh, we see it every day with the fires, the drought, the heat waves, the the uh, pressure on our uh, on our lands and waters. I, maybe just any parting thoughts on how the Department of Interior links conservation to climate action to both uh, preserve our lands, but also to reduce emissions? Absolutely. Well, of course, um, uh, you know, a clean energy future is, is where we are going. And uh, we have shown that um, in many ways, uh, working uh, with our offshore wind and uh, to create um, those clean energy opportunities. Um, we need to we need to cut greenhouse gases. That is the uh, key, um, and, and we need to do it in a big way. And so um, we're working not only to um, get this uh, clean energy revolution and transition, uh, you know, moving forward, but but also, of course, uh, doing all we can to um, to conserve um, those, those places that our wildlife needs. The, you know, as we've often said, um, nature is our greatest ally in the fight against climate change. The more we can build um, resiliency uh, in our wildlife refuges, in our national parks, in our public lands, uh, the better off we will be. So we'll continue on that trajectory. I have a team of amazing people at the department, career staff, um, people know, you know, we all know them. They wear the uniforms proudly and uh, work every day to, um, to make sure that future generations have what we have. So we'll continue that um, every single day. And, um, and I, I'm proud and honored, of course, to work alongside those folks. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, I hope we get to see each other sometime in person. Yes, absolutely. And it's good to know that you're out on the road traveling. So really appreciate all you're doing uh, for both conservation and to tackle the climate crisis. Thank you so much. Thank for being you, with John. Me. Thank you so much. Great. 
And now uh, we have an embarrassment of riches, frankly, uh, friends here this morning. So I get the, the honor of uh, welcoming and introducing our third and final keynote speaker of the day. Brenda Mallory is the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, a role for which she was confirmed by the United States Senate on April 14th, 2021. Uh, uh, Brenda had a distinguished legal career in the private sector and at, e and, e and at EPA. During the Obama administration, we got to work together uh, when she was the general counsel of CEQ, uh, and I was working in the White House, and I can testify that Brenda was the White House and President Obama's go-to lawyer on everything uh, that uh, had anything to do with the environment. Uh, uh, so it's great to see her back uh, in public service. She's the first African-American to serve as chair of CEQ. She advises the president on environmental and natural resource policies that improve, preserve, and protect public health and the environment for America's communities. Uh, and she leads the president's efforts on environmental justice, in, including the Justice uh, 40 initiative. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, uh, Brenda. I'll give you the floor. Excellent. Thanks so much, John, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. I'm excited to be here and to see the very rich and thought-provoking agenda you have planned for this symposium. Before jumping into the substance, I want to share how tremendously honored I am to work in an administration that prioritizes climate action, conservation, the transition towards a clean energy economy and environmental justice. It seems like every day, including today with Secretary Vilsack's announcement, some impactful work in one of these areas is announced. And I'm reminded of the moment we're in and the opportunity we have to really make a difference on the ground. Today, I will focus on some of the key features of our environmental justice work and the integral role it plays in our efforts to tackle climate change including pursuing equity as we work to protect our lands and waters. Before I get to, into specifics about what we are doing in the Biden administration, I wanna talk first about how we got here. Environmental justice at activists have been raising alarm bells for decades that pollution disproportionately impacts black, brown, tribal, and other low-income communities. In 1992, the late Congressman John Lewis introduced the Environmental Justice Act, the first ever piece of legislation dedicated to rooting out environmental injustice. That same year, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12898 on environmental justice. There already existed strong evidence that legal and policy choices were being made that resulted in the most polluting uses and facilities being concentrated in poor communities and communities of color. In the nearly 30 years since the executive order, an intergenerational movement of activists, community members, and leaders, local and state officials, and many members of Congress have continued to push environmental justice onto the agenda. So it is not a mere afterthought for policymakers. But the pandemic placed a powerful spotlight on the consequences of years of environmental injustice. We have seen Black Americans and other people of color dying at a faster rate from COVID-19, partly because of the higher rates of long-term exposure to air pollution. In fact, along with a growing movement focused on a range of historic racial inequities, uh, served as a catalyst in expanding the voices calling for issues of environmental injustice to be addressed. At the White House, we hope to honor the work of the leaders and advocates who came before us by incorporating in equity for overburdened and underserved communities throughout the administration's policy initiatives and adopting a whole of government strategy to environmental justice. President Biden's approach to environmental justice is guided by a belief that every person has a fundamental right to drink clean water, breathe clean air, and live in healthy communities. For too many people, we have failed to deliver those basic protections. Correcting these historic wrongs will require a long-term commitment, but acknowledging a need for change and creating a plan of action is a critical first step. 
President Biden made it clear that his administration will chart a new and better course, one that puts climate action and environmental justice at the center of the work that we do. In order to implement such change, the president created the first ever White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. The council is made up of 26 longtime environmental justice advocates and experts from all across the country. President Biden also established the first ever White House Environmental Justice Interagency Council, which is composed of senior leaders from key agencies. I'm honored to chair this council. These tools facilitate a whole of government approach to pursue environmental justice. That means, for example, asking our federal agencies to evaluate the accessibility and impact of their programs on low-income communities and communities of color, and ensuring that all communities receive the intended benefits. Equally important, President Biden set a historic goal to deliver 40% of the overall benefits from relevant federal investments in clean energy and infrastructure to historically disadvantaged communities. We call this the Justice 40 Initiative. Quite simply, this initiative is a recognition of the underinvestment that has historically occurred in these communities. We know that environmental injustice is exacerbated by climate change and the impacts of the climate crisis are being felt more acutely in black, brown, indigenous and low income communities. At its core, environmental justice is about protecting people's fundamental right to clean water, clean air and a healthy community. While these are our values, this has not been a shared reality for many. Last year's incident in Central Park with Christian Cooper, a black birder, uh, or Amand Aubrey, who was murdered while out for a run, are painful examples that there is still a lot of work to do uh, to make outdoor spaces welcoming to people of color. As a structural inequity, the fact is that we do not have public lands that are easily accessible to most communities of color and low-income communities. In fact, communities of color are three times more likely than white communities to live in places with less or no access to parks, walking paths, and green spaces. To transform our values into a lived reality, we are thinking more broadly and inclusively about how we protect our environment and improve the quality of all Americans' lives now and for decades to come. That is where our American the Beautiful initiative comes in. We have to remember what it is at risk. Our planet is witnessing the mass extinction of animals and plants at a scale that is unprecedented in human history. Unless we take bold, collective, and locally driven action to protect nature, we will lose the sources of our clean drinking water, our clean air, our medicines, our food, and the resources that sustain and power our economy. As the chair of the America the Beautiful Interagency Working Group, CEQ is working to coordinate interagency efforts to deliver on President Biden's America, America the Beautiful initiative, a locally led nationally scaled effort to conserve and restore at least 30% of the nation's lands and waters by 2030 to combat cha these, these challenges. At CEQ, we are also working closely with agencies in their development of, a conservation, of conservation action plans. These plans will identify what programs, regions, and projects can be expanded for greater conservation to meet our nation's first ever national conservation goal. Importantly, America the Beautiful is one that is an initiative that puts equity at the center. With the first focus of the program on expanding parks and green spaces for underserved communities. Too often our lands and waters have also been places of inequitable access and we need to make sure that all Americans feel safe and welcome in our public lands and in our public waters. When reflecting the best version of ourselves we are a nation that believes every child should have the chance to experience the wonders of nature. As we coordinate efforts across government and as we develop these agency conservation action plans, 
We are asking how we can ensure access to nature for all communities. This brings me to our collective role as we meet today and how we can work together to deliver on this vision and imperative. One thing we know is that this plan will only be successful if we actively engage local, state, and tribal governments, community members, and a range of other stakeholders, including you. We need your ideas to identify, build, support, and implement these locally led projects. We want to know what is working, what we can do better, and where we need to put more resources to achieve outcomes in our early focus areas of America the Beautiful. I hope that each and every one of you will see the parks, public lands, and natural systems that you love and rely on as part of this effort and drive action in your own communities to protect those areas for future generations. As we embark on this work, the questions we must answer are, how do we build out clean energy in a better way? How do we effectively leverage the advancements that have already occurred? How do we make sure our federal investments are actually reaching the communities they are designed to help? How do we ensure everyone can have access to our lands and public spaces? This is our challenge and we can do this better, but we can't do it without partners like you. Solving the climate crisis is the challenge of our lifetime and it is going to take all of us. Thank you for the work that you do, and thanks for inviting me to join you today. I'm happy to answer a, a few questions now. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, it's, it's, it's both great to see you, and, and thanks, for, thanks for your leadership. You know, it's been tremendous to see uh, the work uh, that you've spearheaded on environmental justice uh, get off the ground and get rooted across uh, every agency of the federal government. And I, I guess I want to start by asking you a question. I mean, I've, I've got a bunch of questions from the audience, but last summer uh, during the campaign, when uh, then candidate Biden linked the COVID crisis, the resulting economic crisis, the racial justice crisis, and the climate crisis, I think he surprised a lot of people by putting those all into one basket and argued that the country couldn't recover from any unless it addressed them all. And I'm wondering, um, it, 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 during your work at CEQ, how do you see that vision being played out, drawing these threads together on health, on jobs, on the economy, uh, on climate, and on racial justice? Uh, great question, John. And I, I do agree that there, there was some surprise that those things got linked together. But it's important to recognize that as we think in particular about um, climate change and the economic recovery, we know that clean energy and a clean energy economy is what is going to you know, be necessary for uh, the future of climate change, but also will be the engine that helps put people in a position where they can uh, thrive and they can have economic security. Um, and so all across the White House and, and all across the agencies, I think what's really uh, key is that the emphasis on this idea of a whole of government approach to everything means that within every agency, there are conversations going on that are looking at all of the uh, pillars of the president's priorities and thinking about how we add, we, each agency, add our value to solving those problems. And that just ultimately results in there always being sort of a, a rich conversation uh, across the government um, that is focused on these four pillars, but recognizing that all of them are interconnected and need to be addressed in order for us to move forward as a um, healthy, a healthy economic uh, um, uh, system. Uh, let, let me uh, get to the audience questions. The first one is, uh, what do you see as the top two or three priorities for realizing America the beautiful in the uh, Biden administration's first term? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, um, you know, we're fortunate because we do have a culture within uh, uh, this country of having done conservation for 
uh, you know, for, for, for many years, for decades. And so I think we're looking first to kind of harness the work that the agencies are doing using the tools that they already uh, use for conservation, uh, like grants and, um, you know, make prioritizing use, of, use on the public lands uh, in terms of how we uh, protect areas. But because there's such excitement um, from the from really all across the, the country and including in the private sector, um, the partnerships that can be made right now around really um, in, you know, driving where America the Beautiful goes are I think in the, the two categories where I think there's a lot of emphasis and focus on how we leverage this. Um, the, the agencies in their plans are identifying the opportunities that are presented um, through those two mechanisms, what we have done historically and how do we leverage that with the, the increased interest and partnerships that um, are being offered. Uh, there's a question which really asks the flip side. What, what, what do you see as the biggest barriers? What's, what are the biggest challenges uh, in implementing the plan that uh, uh, CEQ coordinated and put out uh, on behalf of the president? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, well, I guess a couple of things. You know, number one, um, one of the challenges I think that the administration is facing on, on kind of all of our issues is we're really trying to do something new. Like we are really looking for um, a way to change the, the molds or shift the molds in a way that can be um, more, uh, you know, maximize the benefits. And so, you know, just the fact that of the newness and trying to get people understanding like what we're trying to achieve both internally and externally, you know, is a, is an, is a, a you know, small hurdle. Um, but also there's always the issue of do we have the, the resources in place? Can we get the resources in the places that we need them most to make sure that we're able to put the attention on what's necessary to really do the locally, you know, to focus on the locally scaled projects, to interact with the local communities in a way that really uh, gives meaning to that. So, so I think, you know, making sure we put the resources where they're needed. And then I would say, um, uh, finally, you know, there's a question about, especially as we are trying to maximize the engagement of our work with, with tribes and, you know, including greater partnerships in uh, what tribes can bring to the table. I think some of our authorities that are currently exist in the con conservation area, you know, don't all directly uh, link uh, uh, tribes into some of the work that the federal government uh, does. And so making sure that we are able to identify what some of those barriers are and, and get them addressed, I think will be important to, uh, again, maximizing the engagement with tribes and, and tribal communities. Hmm. Well, this sort of is a follow up from another audience question. How can America the Beautiful benefit from your work on diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, because uh, the, the president and vice president have prioritized equity issues across the federal government. Like we all have that as one of the top pillars in everything that we're doing in the initiatives. And um, on America the Beautiful, um, as I said in my remarks, there, you know, we know there are gaps in the, um, both the accessibility of green spaces uh, to communities of color, their, their proximity to um, really uh, take advantage of and enjoy um, on nature in a way that, um, you know, some communities can take for granted. And so I think because it is a, already a core pillar in that, we are focused on the, the local parks and local um, connections that, um, uh, you know, as an area of, of uh, attention that we want to prioritize right now. Um, here's one that's uh, close to home for the Salazar Center. Uh, <laughs> Dear Chair Mallory, uh, Secretary Salazar signed the secretarial order that created landscape conservation cooperatives. Congress keeps allocating funding. The last administration let them wither. Can we build on the lessons of LCCs to bring diverse perspectives to advance America the Beautiful? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really important dimension of the work that we are trying to do when we uh, think about building out um, uh, America the, the Beautiful, which is the importance of that, you know, collaboratives on the ground, the, the importance of taking advantage of 
um, what is happening in communities and what it tells us about what's important for those communities as we you know, think about a, a number of different conservation approaches, but certainly uh, landscape um, uh, uh, scale uh, commitments. Um, uh, here's a great question. How can CEQ, USDA and DOI create a national framework that supports grassroots collaborative landscape conservation for the long term? Um, okay, good question. I mean, in some ways, I think the way I envision the, the work that we're doing, the, the agency's named, uh, it is kind of doing that, right? I mean, we're, it's sort of accepting as, um, as a premise that in order to achieve the kind of national goals, there is value in recognizing and lifting up the work that is going on in, uh, in local areas and really um, expanding on that, that that in some ways, community by community, place by place, is a better, um, is, is, a, is, you know, is a powerful way of making sure that we meet the goals in ways that communities all feel a part of and have an opportunity to participate in. So I, I feel like we're, that's what we're trying to do uh, in the America, the Beautiful Initiative and, uh, and implement it in a way that has that effect. Um, just a very basic question from the audience, which is, how does the public uh, engage with your council? Uh, and uh, as well as uh, uh, NGOs is uh, in the question, but what's yeah, the portal to, to have, to get ideas, to get information, to uh, set priorities? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. I think one of our, the way that we're sort of thinking about um, the approaches going forward, as, as I mentioned, we have these action plans um, that, the, that the agencies are doing that are focused on um, opportunities that we want to really prioritize going forward. Uh, and for those, I mean, you know, a lot of the things that the agencies are putting forth are already um, a reflection of what we heard when we first uh, launched the idea of America the Beautiful and said that we wanted to do this. So um, I think that we've already started by taking advantage of what we've heard so far, but I think for each of the specific projects that are, are likely to move forward, there will be opportunities for specific engagement. And so I would say, stay tuned, watch our websites. We'll make sure that as we're um, you know, collecting uh, information right. about what seems to make the most sense in communities that people will know that. But apart from that, I always say, just you know, write us. We we get we get mail from people on a lot of things. Uh, if you have some specific idea that you somehow think we've missed, definitely reach out and and let us know, and we'll be happy to um, talk about that. I think your work, your the CEQ is working uh, to determine just how much uh, of the U.S. is currently protected. Do you do you know how those numbers will be used to kind of help shape policy going forward as we? try to hit the 20, the 30 by 30 target in 2030? Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, everybody recognized uh, the importance of having an understood baseline, like to an understanding of like where we are. And, and I think that will influence what we think should be prioritized in order to kind of achieve the results that we are, we're trying to achieve. But first step is really understanding where we are. And, you know, part of that effort, as you know, but just so the audience is aware, um, is, was a recognition that there are certain lands that, of course, we have been tracking, but, but we haven't been tracking, for example, all of the work that's being done by tribes or has been done in terms of uh, areas that are conserved, some of the uh, conservation that's occurring on, um, you know, uh, with private partners. We're not aware of all of that. And so the mechanisms that the agencies are exploring for, you know, just ground truthing um, you know, what we would say is already conserved, I think is going to be important in helping to the prioritization going forward. Just uh, two more, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, does uh, this, we've had three agency heads here this morning, but I think this one is probably directed to the acting head of OMB, but I want to know what whether you have <laughs> leaned into the Office of Management and Budget on this question, does environmental justice for tribes include discussion of funding gaps to tribes? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we are talking about the the funding issues across the board in all of um, the president's uh, priorities and and recognizing as we do these assessments on, you know, what are our opportunities, but what are our bar barriers that some of our barriers do, um, you know, point to funding. And I think there definitely are conversations going on about how uh, how we best address some of those. So um, uh, it, Shalanda might have actually a specific example <laughs> about what that looks like, but I can tell you that I know that conversations are definitely occurring about um, those kinds of gaps. Well, this is another place to bring it back to what's going on on Capitol Hill today, because so much of the funding, uh, particularly in the Build Back Better bill, uh, will be useful in, a, in, able, in being able to kind of close that gap. So hopefully Congress will uh, do what it needs to do and, and, and take this urgent action. So last question, which I think is, uh, is, is one that probably is on uh, people's minds. Uh, across the uh, conservation community, which is how can we ensure that this initiative is truly transformational and additional in addressing the biodiversity and climate crises and does not devolve into becoming just an accounting exercise of existing protections to meet the goal? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a really a great question. I mean, I think we are very mindful of wanting to be sure that there is um, that, you know, that, that we are really accomplishing something uh, bold. I mean, we, we see the goal and having the goal as a bold step by the president. Um, and I think as we are developing these plans and moving forward with, you know, specific initiatives under the program, it's, it's definitely our intention to try to make sure that we are looking beyond the low hanging fruit and imagining what the best opportunities uh, would be for really reaching um, the goal that the president has set. So yes, front and center. <laughs> uh, is there a specific thing that I would tell you? No, I think like everything else, uh, it's really important that these issues are a part of the conversation and that we're trying to just make sure that there are gonna be specific things we'll be able to point to and how this uh, program has changed the, the the landscape. Well, uh, Chairman Ellery, thank you. That was terrific, and I really want to thank you for your leadership and uh, and uh, invite you to uh, keep us all engaged and involved in support of what you're trying to do there. It's really critical uh, for the president's success, but for the success of the country. Really appreciate your being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. And it's good thank to you see so you. Much. you as well. <laughs> Take care.